Hi, everyone. Hope you're well. Thank you for joining us today for our second workshop um, for the GRE qualitative section uh, for the year 2023. I'm Umaira Dao. I'm working as an educational advisor at the Islamabad office. We are grateful to our instructor, Dr. Ali Hassan Kazim, uh, for doing the session with us. Dr. Ali is an, the inaugural director of automotive, uh, automotive Engineering Center at the University of Engineering and Technology, Lahore. He is a Fulbright scholar and has earned a doctorate uh, degree in mechanical engineering from Georgia uh, Institute of Technology, uh, Atlanta, United States of America. Before we start the session, I want to highlight that Please remember that this year our Fulbright application cycle has started early uh, from January to April 12, 2023. Also this year, the GRE minimum score has been revised. The minimum score for both quantitative and verbal section is 145. Please uh, check out our website and Facebook page for information and updates regarding the Fulbright scholarship. Um, also, if you have any questions about GRE, test, you can reach out to our testing department at testing at uscfp.org. The testing department also provides a mock uh, test surface for GRE. You can write to, the, to testing at uscfp.org or call 051-227-2708 to book an appointment. Wait for the confirmation before showing up at the center. Also, there's a, a 500 rupee fee for the mock test. For any questions, you can contact the relevant department at testing at uscfp.org. I will now hand over the session to Dr. Ali to begin quantitative uh, workshop. Uh, just a quick question. Are the audience this time different from the last time? Uh, we don't have any idea. Maybe people, some people must be new, but some people are maybe joining again so that they can have okay. another session. Okay, cool. Okay. So my name is Dr. Ali Sen Kazim. Uh, so here's my introduction slide. Um, I have a PhD in mechanical engineering from Georgia Institute of Technology. With specialization in energy conversion and heat transfer. I'm a Fulbright alumni. I'm the director of Automotive Engineering Center. I'm the focal person for scholarship, international scholarship at UET. So it, uh, like all this introduction that you see where I am right now, I owe it largely to Fulbright because um, this was my third time applying to Georgia Tech and my second time applying to Fulbright. So if you are thinking of applying this time, don't think, apply. And uh, it's it's a really a way of transforming your career, transforming your lives, because the education, otherwise you can't afford the education. Uh, and so don't miss the boat, apply this here. Okay, now introduction to- My interjection here, sorry. Just wanted to let everybody know that they, when, if they have any questions, they have to put them in the Q&A box and uh, Dr. Ali will answer them as he goes through the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. So um, intro to the quantitative section and uh, testing strategies, books for practice, questions, what to do next. So starting out with introduction. So what does GRE assess? GRE assess how well you take the GRE exam. So what depends on how well you take the GRE exam is how much you are familiar with the exam. The more familiar you are with it and the better it is. So this test would help you. Today's workshop, I will um, share how to get more familiar with the exam. So uh, Sarmad, you can type the question in the chat box. Question you have. So how well you take the GRE would depend how familiar you are with it. So today's in today's while going through the slides, you will know how to get familiar, what to practice, especially for those of you who are applying in one month's time, what to do. And for those who are taking longer, uh, what to do then? There's one question from Emmons Faraz. If the GRE score is less than 145, then what will happen, pass or fail? That 145 score is a Fulbright requirement. You would still get the score. There's no pass and fail in um, the GRE exam. Uh, as for Fulbright, they, so I would leave that answer to my host. Um, so, uh, so uh, 
145 is minimum score. Um, um, it will definitely depend mm -hmm. from case to case basis as well, but we would prefer, you can um, contact info at uscfp.org and ask this question to them. Okay. So um, moving on. So what is what are the different sections in the GRE exam? So it has the uh, analytic, analytical writing section, verbal reasoning section, quantitative reasoning section. So these are the different sections that it has. Which will not count towards the final score, but you will not know whether it will count or not because it would not be marked as unscored. So you should um, attempt every uh, question as if every section as if it will count towards your final score. So the research section, if you are very unlucky, you might get another section called the research section. So um, that would be labeled, but attempt every section as if it will count towards the final score. So the math section, the math section has two 35 minute sections, each of which will have 20 questions. There are seven or eight questions of each section will be quantitative comparison. The remainder will be multiple choice or numeric entry. So it tests 20 math concepts. So what's the difficult part if it's testing 20 math concepts? 20 math concepts, the, the thing about 20 math concepts is that one question has at least two or three concepts. So math should be like doing, doing those things should be like second nature to you, that you should be so comfortable that when a question comes having two or three concepts, you, you after reading it once, you start attempting it and hopefully get it right. So the most important ability is to read carefully. It tests uh, how carefully do you read the problems and figure out how to set them up is more important. Your ability to set your problems up is more important than your ability to calculate. So most problems are real world problems and they give you a real world situation and ask you to solve for it. So the calculating part, solving an equation, that is like 20% of the question. Like the bulk of the question is like setting up the problem, making the equation. And believe it or not, the most math errors are results of careless mistakes caused by not reading the problem carefully enough. So the most important thing is that you should read your problem very carefully. So the most important instruction is read and copy carefully, read and copy carefully, read and copy carefully. This is the most important instruction that. And calculator use only absolutely necessary. The calculator that you have in the GRE exam is similar to the calculator we have in our laptop. So how many times have I have we used our laptops calculator not many because it's not user friendly similarly the calculator in the gre exam the computer calculator is not that friendly so use it to calculate the final answer so if you have solved everything and you're at the final answer or the you just need it to compute one thing then use it otherwise don't so read and copy carefully is the most important instruction so types of questions. So the MCQs have five options. It is multiple choice. So five options are A, B, C, D, and E. So the options are A, um, B, C, D, and E. And all those options are in an ascending or a descending order which basically means that the C option is right at the middle, always. 
So the option A, let's say, is one. Option number two is two. Option number C is 10. And let's say the option number D is 15. And option E is, let's say, 25. So the option number C is right there in the middle. So which means that if you have to, some sometimes you have to substitute an option to see whether it is correct or not. So always start with option number C. From there, you can see whether you want to move up or move down from that. One of the questions is, what is the criteria for marking? Are all questions equally marked? Uh, they are, we don't know that whether they are equally marked or not. They are, we don't know how uh, ETS GRE exam converts a raw score to an actual score. So there is no, um, but for uh, calculation for sample for uh, while solving a test, you mark them equally. Every question weighs one point. So if you do 20 questions and you get, let's say for 20 question, 20 marks, you get like, let's say 18 out of it. So how an 18 out of 20 is scaled to an actual score, we don't know. How do they do that? But um, so you can, you can safely say that each question weighs equally, but um, um, weighs equally, but um, you, you can't be sure that what would be that conversion. So Sarmad seems to be a superstar in our class right now, he says five point work enough to have 170 out of 70 in quant. So five point book is, um, yes, for practice, yes, but five point book would only make you practice types of questions. The exam setting, how can you pace your exam? For that, you need to have test practice as well. So five point book is enough for concept, for making your concepts better. But if you want exam prep for that, you need to take an actual test. So I'll get to that in a bit. Because five pound book is not timed and test is, you know, it's, it's pretty fast. You don't have much time to solve a question. So moving on. Um, so we have, so always start with option number C, that if you have to substitute, a, so always start, so substitute with option number C. After substituting, substituting it, you, you would know whether you need to substitute something that is above or something that is below. So multiple choice and multiple answers. So multiple choice is that you, for one question, you would have three or four answers. You need to click on all of them to make sure that the answer is correct. So the next question is quantitative comparison question. In the quantitative comparison question, there is no option E. So it's only A, B, C, and D. And um, if a quant question only contains number on both sides, the answer can't be D. So in a quant question, you have two quantities which you have to compare. So quantity, let's say quantity A and quantity B. If quantity A has some numbers, let's say 79 times 96, and quantity B is, let's say, 78 times 97. It means that both sides have quantity A and B, and both are numbers. So you can always compare the two because both sides, we have numbers. So while 
comparing the two numbers. So option D is not an option when you're comparing numbers. Option number D is that you have insufficient information. So always compare, don't calculate because calculating the answer would take much longer. Um, but in like, let's say for this question, which I've just typed, which is like, I just made it up for that. It's better that you calculate. But uh, typically the questions are not that simple in quantitative comparison. So next is numeric entry. In the numeric entry, you have to type in the answer. You have to uh, type in the answer. Now there are two techniques of how to approach this test. The first technique is that you take the easy test first. So this technique is for uh, test takers who have uh, who have done a lot of practice and who by reading a question once know that this is a difficult question and they can maybe skip it. So this the first technique is for advanced test takers. The second technique, bend, don't push, which means that you have to attempt every question as if you're seeing it for the first and the last time. Because uh, typically you get one and a half or two minutes for one question. So the first time you read it, you try to understand it. The second time you read it, you start writing down, you start solving. And you can always solve by writing down. So by this technique, when you are giving every question its due share of time, you will come across questions which you would know that are very difficult or you might solve them wrong or the answer you have just got is maybe, maybe you're not 100% sure, but you still go for the answer, you click on the answer and move on. So by that, uh, you would need to bend a bit like you would have to uh, forego some mistakes and you keep on going. The next thing is that process of elimination, POE is very important. If you eliminate one wrong answer, suddenly your chances of getting to the right answer increase tremendously. Then is ballparking and trap answers. Ballpark, ballparking is that approximating. Sometimes you have to approximate and uh, be wary of trap answers. So trap answers are, um, let me ask this question and all I want all of you to type in the answer. Okay, so everyone. So a price of a shirt increases in the month of November by 20%. And in the month of March, that, prices, that price decreased by 20%. So type in the answers. So what is the new price compared to the old price, the, the first price? New price compared to the original price. You may type in the answer, so I am getting answers. Okay. Okay, I have, I'm getting answers. And uh, okay, more answers. Okay, so of the all the answers, I got majority answers wrong, okay? Majority of them say, says it's uh, that there's no change, right? That is a wrong answer. That is a trap answer. Every year, every day for that matter, thousands of people give a GRE exam. They know exactly. Osama, I can read your chart so you can tap it basically. So every year, thousands of people give the GRE exam. So the GRE the ETS are fully aware of the mistakes that we make. And those mistakes appear as answer choices, which uh, they give. 
So trap answers, they know the mistakes, they know the option that we would say. So one clue of knowing what is the trap answer, if an answer seems too obvious without any calculation, it is most likely a trap answer. So I had just explained this and I'm explaining, explaining it again and now explaining the question which I gave you. So originally, let's say the price of a thing was let's say 100. And I said it's a 20% increase in the price. So, which basically means that I multiply this thing with 20%. The meaning of percent is one over 100. So if I multiply this, the increase in price is 20. So the new price is 120. Now I ask that, it, it, and it decreases by 20%. So now the 20% is 20% of the new price, which is 120. So if we take the 20% of this, so if we take 20% of this, it comes out to be 24. So the new price is 120 minus 24, which is 96. So, so the new price is lesser than the original price. So this is a this was a trap answer. And the good news about all of this test is that all of you have done this math. You know more than you think. Why all of you have done this math? Because the level of the math is like eighth, ninth, seventh, eighth, ninth grade math. It's not beyond that. The only thing that is beyond is that we are not in Pakistan that comfortable in dealing with word problems and especially unknown word problems. Like our system is such that it does not give us new questions. So that's the difference. So we need to share, know how to, whatever we study, we need to let the content sink. Just a second. I'm sorry, my three-year-old daughter just uh, uh, came in the class. So coming back to the class. So you know more than you think. That's the good news. So, but we're not familiar with doing unknown problems. So by doing a lot of practice, we get to the, we get, we get really good. So one of the, one of the common question is that, which I've read in the chat as well, is, are two months enough? Are... Doing a Manhattan is enough. Doing this is enough. So the answer to is that, what do you want out of the GRE exam? I had a, um, my roommate in the next room in US had his bachelor's from US. He did, so to, to get a bachelor's degree from US, you need to give, in, to give a SAT exam. So he had his um, bachelor's from US. His master's was also from US. So he gave the GRE exam. Now he was, what, now, when, when he was with me, he was preparing for the GMAT exam because he wanted to get into a top business school. And this was, first, this was someone who was a U.S. national who had done SAT, who had done GRE, who had done like similar exams in the past. Now he was preparing for GMAT. And every day I could see he was putting in one or two hours preparing for the exam. He was working for the topmost mobile company in US AT&T. And then um, he just wanted to go to a top school and 
and after one and a half year of prep he did not got into that school so he applied again and the next time he um, he got the call he he got good marks and he he work for a very top uh, bank right now so it depends on how what do you want out of it so the more the practice you do the better your chances are so i'm sure the people who get full marks in gre i'm i'm sure they practice really hard even if they do get the full marks so and i assure you the time you put in this exam will surely pay off it will pay off like this test is similar to test which some of the companies take in pakistan some of the multinational companies their test is similar to a gre so the you will certainly um, it'll certainly pay off uh, preparing for the exam so how to study for it so let the content sink give yourself time that you understand each and every concept and then you take it from there and slow and steady wins the race so if you um if you have time or even if you don't have time it's just one month make sure that what you do is you, you understand it fully fully an example of it is that let's say you take a practice test today so a practice test a, sim, a typical math section would take you like 1 hour 15 minutes to finish after you finish the test don't stop there give yourself half an hour 40 minutes to assess the mistakes that you make so whatever you do whatever you do make sure that you do it well and the only way to do it well is through practice that's the only way that you can do well so practice practice and practice so now the quantitative reasoning section it is a basic math section it has 16 questions so roughly the math basically is it takes 40% of your uh section so what is a um, basic math so basic math is basically arithmetic so basically plus minus division and multiplication so the basic math is the three operate the four operations and and all these questions stem from that so even it's a word problem so it is is basic math the the next is algebra algebra is when you, once you go beyond numbers and you talk about variables x y and z it becomes algebra then the geometry geometry is when you have shapes and finally the data analysis so although the question it only says that the basic math or the arithmetic is only 40% but all the following algebra geometry and data analysis eventually become a uh, arithmetic question so your arithmetic your basic arithmetic should be really good as for data analysis though it only says six questions and geometry only says it has eight question geometry and data analysis are easier to cover because not only their weightage is less but the content is also less so if you have less time if you have let's say gre exam in the coming month you need to do the geometry and data analysis maybe first but nothing you can't hide from basic math you need to have good basic math and um, i don't have time right now to take the um gr exam uh, your gr exam but what i typically see is that most of the people i come across uh score below um 50th percentile and i teach at an engineering institute which people have excellent math but somehow their percentile is uh, below 50 and the main reason for having a percentile below the 50 50th percentile is your basic math so get your basic math right 
if you have time do the geometry and the data analysis first because it will be easier to cover now the books so ets gre math review is a free book having four chapters it, this the first book does not have any questions so you won't have practice but it is like the syllabus of the gre it has the content is like it is a syllabus it has everything if you if you do it well if you if you understand everything it means you're all set but you also need practice to show your understanding so the practice comes from the official gre cognitive reasoning practice questions so these are again from the ets uh, then comes a big book for practice big book is uh, a book by ets and it has actual 27 practice tests so ets stopped uh, uh, updating this book and th there was no actual uh, run up of this book where you could have actual practice tests so this book you have actual practice tests then you have the five pound book of gre practice problem which is from manhattan so this is this book has a lot of practice which is segmented in chapters so let's say you right now decide that you need to work on exponents or you need to work on percentage so you go to this book and you can practice a lot over here then comes another publisher princeton its book is cracking the gre it has five chapters and then balance so it has four chapters so all all the all these books is a good practice um, but if you if you have very less time if you have uh, let's say one month then book number 2 is easier to cover because it has less practice you can do some of the test of the big book and if you can let the content in the ets chap book number 1 sink in that will be do good but for chapter wise practice you need to go to manhattan book number 4 now what is a good score so these are the statistics from june july 2014 to june 2017 um 17 lakh 27000 people gave the verbal reasoning 70 lakh 30000 gave the uh, quantitative reasoning and they scored 153 so the mean score of a verbal exam is 150 and that for quant is 153 which means that if you score above if you score 151 in verbal and 153 in quantitative, you are better than 50% of the people appearing in the test. And this should be the starting aim that for each of the two components, you need to be better than the 50% people. You need to be above the 50th percentile. So this is the initial aim, but the higher you do, the better it is. Now, these are the different scales of the GRE. How does the percentile change? And, and the graduate schools are interested, or even Fulbright is interested in knowing your individual percentile. So for example, if you are, a, let's say, um, applying for um, a PhD in some uh, literature, English literature, or some, let's say, history or some social science, in which your verbal skills need to be more important. So if you're that student, you need to score higher or you, your score in verbal counts more. But if you, let's say, applying for engineering or computer science, so for you, maybe quantitative reasoning is more important and you need to score higher there. But let's say you're applying for a, uh, let's say, an uh, a business related degree. So for a business related degree, your verbal as well as quant skills are both, let's say, equally important. So you need to score this and look uh, on the bottom right, you can see that for a score of 
130, you would get a one percentile. So this basically mean if you score 130, you're better than one percent people. And let's say, look at the GREs, look at what Fulbright is asking you to do. Fulbright is asking you that you need to have a minimum of 145 in each of your components, which basically means in verbal reasoning, you would be better than 27% people. And in the quant, you'd be better than 20% people. So that's the minimum. That's really low what they're asking for. And you need to score much higher. Like it has, uh, Fulbright is very competitive and everyone knows it. Everyone is applying to it. It's uh, I'm like, it's the way to, to go to US education. So have your score higher. So, okay. Then comes um, analytical writing. So in analytical writing, uh, in analytical writing, you have a score of three, you're better than 17 percent people. But if you have a score of four, you're certainly better than 59% people. So a jump of, um, let's say, a jump of from three to four is, it increases your scores a lot. So be aware of this jump and try to aim, prepare for this test as well. I know it's less important in many cases, but it's good to have score good in all sections or be good, be above average in all sections. The first question for all of you. So find the quotient and remainder for this question, 19 divided by seven. Please answer, please write the answer in the chat box. Okay, so we so far have um, four or five answers and all of them are same. No, there is one different answer. So, but most of you have it, right? Okay. Uh, now the next question is, the next question is, I'm asking you to solve, is minus 73 divided by 10. Now find the quotient and the remainder. So yet if the car, I can see your chart, so it means this is not disabled. So chat is active. I can see many messages here. So, okay, I have a couple of answers. So I, I'm asking you to find the quotient and remainder. So, so far I have few answers and all of them are wrong. So 
this question is an example of like like some things we are not just familiar with we so we get it wrong just because we are not familiar with them so to solve it uh, let's solve the previous question which all of you got it right so let me solve this question so question was 19 divided by 7 so how do you do it you multiply 7 with a number such that you get a number which is equal to 19 if you can't get 19 a number just less than that so 7 twos are 14 and the difference between the two is 5 that is the remainder so you have a quotient of 2 and a remainder of 5. Now the next question, which I asked all of you, and which all of you should have done right because uh, you got the first question right. So minus 73 divided by 10. So I need to divide, I need to multiply Num it with a number such that the number I get is slightly less than minus 73. So if I multiply it with minus 7, I would get minus 70, which is greater than minus 73. So if I multiply it with minus 8, if I multiply it with minus 8, I would get minus. 80, which is less than minus 73. Now, subtracting minus 73 from it minus 80. So what would you get? You would get a remainder of 7. So we have a quotient of minus 8 and a remainder of 7. Now, next question. Do this question. Yeah, very nice. I have one, like the correct answer. Out of a total of four or five, I have one correct answer. So the question is when the positive integer n is divided by three, the remainder is two. And when that n is divided by five, the remainder is one. What is the least possible value of n? So before answering this question, Let's say n is a number such that when we divide it by 3, the remainder is 0. So for which numbers can we get a remainder of 0 divided by 3? So what would be those numbers? All the numbers in the table of 3, 3, 6, 9, 12, 15. So these numbers, 3, three 6, 9, all these numbers in the table of 3, we, we would get a remainder of um, 
zero if we divide them by three. But right now we are looking for a remainder of two. So all these numbers in the table of three, if we add two to them, Now, if we add uh, um, now, if we add uh, if we divide three with them, we would get a remainder of three. Now, the next condition is that the remainder is two when n is divided by five. So, similarly, five ones are five. In the table of five, if we divide by five, we would get a remainder of uh, zero. But now we are looking for a remainder of one. So five multiplied by five plus one, five multiplied by two, ten plus one, five multiplied by three, fifteen plus one. So the lowest possible value of the uh, n is eleven. So this, these, the last two questions were on the same concept of division. And though all of you are familiar with them, but they were kind of difficult to answer. So there, this is, um, that is why you need a lot of practice. So what are the prime divisors of 144? very nice atyam azhar has answered it right so what are the prime divisors of 144 so you need to remember the first 10 prime numbers of uh, prime numbers why i say you need to remember the first 10 because in the ets math review they have listed down those 10 numbers so you should know the first 10 prime numbers and how to get uh, prime numbers here. So for that, you need one forty four. So divide by two, we get seventy two. Then as we keep on dividing by two, 36, so 18, 2, 9, and finally, the last two numbers, 2, so of these, the prime factors are two and three. That's the correct answer. Many of you got it right. That is good. Now do this question. ETS loves patterns. So a question similar to this is very common in ETS.
let's see who gets it right. So Rami Safar has given an answer. Okay, two of the people have got it right. So, so in the sequence above, the first three terms without repeat, without end. So the first three terms, the first three terms repeat without an end. And we need to take the product of 81st term through the 85th term. So we need to take the product from 81st term and onwards. So first, the term that we want to get to, we need to get to 81st term. So we write it on the top and we divide it by the pattern, the number of terms in the pattern, which basically 81 divided by three. So this comes out to be 27. So basically what we have done up till now is that we have found out how much, how many times the pattern has repeated. So it has repeated 27 times. So once the pattern has repeated, it means that it is on the last, it has done the repetition. So it's on the last term. Oh, just a second. which basically means that it is on the uh, last term. So if it's, it's, if it's on the last term, so it's on term number five, which is term number minus five. So this is the last term. 81 divided by 3, we got 27, and it means that we have completed our pattern. 81st term is this. Then comes 82nd. So 5 minus 2 is minus 5 minus 2 is 10. Then the 83rd, 84th, and 85th term. So we need to multiply up till this. So 5. Minus 5 minus 2 is 10. 10 times 3, 30. 30 times minus 5 is minus 150. Time minus 2 is 300. So the product of 81st through 85th term is 300. So that's... And now one final question. And after that, I will be answering any of the pending Question, I'll give you a minute to solve this. Okay, I have two answers, Hamza and an anonymous attendee. Can I have more answers?
can you hear me i'm sorry you got disconnected yes i can hear you doctor okay sorry about that um uh, how much did we miss i think so a minute or two okay so the greatest number of non negative integers so we have to start with the smallest non negative integer so what is the smallest non negative integer it is um zero so all of you miss the zero once you were um writing the numbers so if you if you include the zero you would have seven consecutive integers which are non negative so quantity a is bigger so now i'll take questions if there are any pending questions um you may ask Um, so the non-negative integer in, uh, integers were from zero onwards: zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you all, if you add numbers from zero to six, you would get a number twenty-one, and those are a total of seven. Uh, integers so the answer is less than that so any other question so there was one question i am a social science student and quantitative section seems difficult are four weeks time enough to get prepared three four hours a day so this is all time that you have so make most of it and three to four hours is a lot of time every day so try to do that take the power prep test there's a free power prep test available on the ets website today know your score now so there are two tests which are freely available take one right now and take the other once you are done with the preparation so that you know what has improved uh, so this is it for today Thank you so much, Dr. Ali, uh, for such a wonderful session. Um, I'm sure our, our audience has benefited from the information and techniques shared during the session. Um, the recording of the session, just a note, uh, would be available uh, on our USAFP YouTube channel, um, and a link will be posted on Education USA and USAFP Facebook uh, pages. Um, you can access the, the session from there. Um, please, uh, one thing I want to highlight, if you are unable to book, um, a slot uh, on the official www.ets.org website. Uh, please contact our uh, testing department at testing at uscfp.org and we will help you find a slot um, for the GRE exam. Also, if you have more questions about Fulbright, please contact our program department at info at uscfp.org. And if you have questions about GRE, please contact us, the testing department at testing at uscfp.org. Thank you very much for your participation for today. And thank you very much, Dr. Ali, for um, agreeing to do this session with us. Thank you so much. Good luck, everyone.